what we're looking at today is real linear algebra now. And what we're going to be doing is starting off with what's called uh, section zero here. And all these section numbers are from the online textbook. There's a link to that right off the front page in on cue. Uh, numbering. So if you're wondering when we refer to sections here, it's based on or tied into the online textbook. So a lot of this is stuff that some of you have seen before. And that's totally fine. We're just trying to get everybody up to the same page because it's certainly not universal these days. And the idea is that the building blocks for linear algebra are going to be sets. And a set is just a collection of objects. And this can be fairly broad, like something like uh, capital cities. And capital cities would be things like Ottawa, Paris, London, etc. And dot, dot, dot here will be a frequently used uh, expression in linear algebra to say, yeah, the things along that line. Of course, it doesn't have to be, and most likely won't be things like that in our particular world of linear algebra. What we're going to be more interested in are sets like that involve numbers, some numeric quantities here. So prime numbers. The prime numbers include one, two, three, five, seven, but not nine, 11, and 13, and so on. The, that would make a lovely set. It ha has a collection of objects in it that are that have something in common in this case here. We could also have things like the integers between uh, 1 and 10. And we would write that out simply by listing all of those numbers. There we go. And that'd be fine. A more exotic set might be something like the negative whole numbers. And so that might be minus one. Sorry, these are curly brackets, which I tend to rush when I write minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on. So this is just a little reminder, right? We've, we've You've seen sets before, you've dealt with them informally. We're gonna present them a little more formally here. And it's always a good idea to take a look at the textbook as well and just skim it through at either before or after class uh, to get maybe another take on to a second view on what we're doing. Pardon me. Uh, one of the interesting classifications for these kinds of sets, of course, is whether they're finite or infinite. Uh, there's a finite number of capital cities there are an infinite number of prime numbers. The integers between 1 and 10 inclusive are definitely a finite set. And negative whole numbers, of course, would be infinite as well. We just keep counting downwards. So again, you already have some informal understanding of how these things work and what these things are. What we're going to do is introduce some of our favorite sets for this course. And hopefully, hopefully there'll be some of your favorites by the end as well. Uh, let's start off with the easy one that we've all seen, the real numbers. And we try to, wherever possible, put with these fancy uh, typeset things that sort of distinguishes them from the, the letter R. And if we can do that, we'll do that in typesetting. Sometimes if we're mapping it out or drawing it by hand, we just do the vertical bar uh, for the R. We don't get too fancy with it. So the, the hand-drawn real number line is this. The hand-drawn uh, complex number is that. Um, excellent question. Sorry, I just saw the comment there for clicker. I will put it on here in a second. Oh, sorry, it should be in the front page of the notes. If you go to the front page of the notes, if, excellent, something else got you covered. Fantastic. All right. And of course, the real numbers are a fascinating set. We already know them, though. So don't belabor it, but for some examples, it would be numbers like three, 4.725. Uh, that's still rationals though. Let's go pi and e. All of those are in the examples of real numbers. Complex numbers should also be slightly familiar now after our class in APSC 171 last term. Complex numbers. 
And examples of this, of course, would be numbers like three, 4.725, but also, well, those numbers would implicitly have plus no imaginary part in them. And then we would maybe get a little more jazzy and say, well, 2.5 plus 6i, some combination of a real and imaginary components. That would be our family of complex numbers. Now, if you go on the internet, which is always a dangerous place to go and get advice from, uh, this symbol here is what we're going to call, I'm going to keep calling it the natural numbers just because it's got the n in it and it seems to work. Sorry, let me put this over here. Natural numbers. You'll also sometimes see these called the whole or the uh, non-negative, if that makes you happier. But honestly, I'm going to call them the natural numbers just because I'm going to see the end. That's what's going to happen. And the big debate about this is whether zero is a natural number. And we, for the purposes of this class, are going to say yes. Zero is in this set that we're going to call n. Again, if you Google this, you'll get a debate about whether zero is a natural number or not, because we, it had to get invented, whereas counting things came naturally and natural then would be one, two, three, four. I don't care. Our answer for this class is zero is a natural number. Uh, the complement or the extension of that is the set of integers. All integers here, which is what we're going to label Z, I'm guessing probably from some German mathematician back in the day. Uh, and this is all the integers, including negative integers as well. So it goes up to zero and goes up from there. So exactly what you'd expect if you include negative or allow negative values as well. All right, so those are a bunch. Let's add in one other one that we've already seen and that you're seeing a lot more of now that you're in multivariate calculus, uh, R2. So pronounced R2 or R, you don't usually say R squared, it's R than the number, even though it looks like an exponent. And this is a set of tuples, uh, set of tuples. For example, uh, with each element, each element being a real. A real number. So somehow we are combining our real numbers in a new way, but again, one that you've seen before. So examples of this would be the number two, five in brackets, where we have this combination of two values side by side, pi e, etc. So we can combine these sets, these building blocks of the comfortable sets together into even larger spaces in some sense. We'll talk about size of spaces as we go forward. Some sets that probably most of you have not seen, though I've got a clicker question in a second to test this out, are these next three. Well, the last one you've probably seen, but this one here, C infinity, is the set of all infinitely, infinitely differentiable functions. So functions can be members of a set. So far, we just looked at numbers. But examples of this would be something like uh, x, x squared, x to the 10. First quick sanity check here. When we say infinitely differentiable, it means I can differentiate this. Say to get 2x, I can differentiate again. I'll get uh, 2, differentiate again, and I'll just get 0. And I just differentiate 0 over and over and over again. The, the values might go to zero, but zero is a perfectly fine function as well. So in fact, let's include that in here. Uh, zero is a perfectly valid function, so it's one. And so is, oh, ln, actually, there's some issues with it with the domain. So I better say on some domain, domain, domain. And we'll talk about that a bit tomorrow, sorry, in Thursday's class. Um, 
let's actually leave that out for now though just because it's obviously complicated e to the x is another good example though because it's very clearly infinitely differentiable anyway there's we can imagine there's some functions that do well with this and some ones that don't especially with domain issues uh and sorry i should have added one extra thing down here which is by default we can limit to some domain but more typically it's that they are uh continuous I should have been the same color because it's not a separate condition. And continuous, that's what the C is for actually, uh, continuous on all of the reels. That's where I was actually going with that. Uh, and excellent question there about the sines and cosines. Absolutely, sine of x would be in there. Cos of x wouldn't be in there. Tan of x would fall afoul of this infinitely or it's continuous everywhere part because it has those asymptotes but sine and cosine absolutely we can differentiate them as much as we like and we just keep getting more and more of the same and yes any polynomial that's a combination of these of course you can differentiate this plus that plus that and you'll just eventually get to zero if you keep differentiating but any polynomial will work in here okay uh, so that's, a, it's a huge set. <laughs> I mean, it's not every single function because tan of X and ln of X wouldn't be in there, but a whole bunch of functions are. Uh, what about this P function here? Well, this is actually what we just mentioned here, polynomials. So polynomial, and we just get a little more specific here of degree N or lower. So if we imagine P3 has or contains, contains, for example, you know, X cubed, that'd be an obvious one. Uh, 3X cubed minus 2X minus one, but it also contains X squared or the function zero as well and one and so on. So as long as the degree of the highest power is three or lower, then we're in P3. If you had P10, you could have X to the 10th power and that would be okay. Uh, and ninth and eighth and seventh, sixth, all the way down to the constant functions again. I'm sorry, we could put another function here like 10 or seven. All of those constants, X, X squared, X cubed would all be uh, possible constituents in the P3 set. And last but not least, this little phi symbol here is what we used for the empty set. And often it's just written as the curly brackets with nothing in between. And notice that's different from, from the zero set. And this gets into programming. It's the idea of the difference between null set or null set, uh, between having a value of zero and not existing. Those are two different things. In terms of P sub zero, that's an interesting observation. Yeah, if P zero is something we wanted to look at, it's all the degree zero uh, functions. So it would be, in fact, it would actually equal the real, <laughs> it wouldn't equal the real line, but it would be somehow congruent to the real line uh, because it would have, for example, all the constant valued functions, one, two, 2.7 pi. Yeah, but functions with that output, that constant output value, exactly. Uh, so sorry, not same as integers, same as the reals-ish. What you'd actually be looking for there is the word isomorphic, way, way beyond what we want to do today. But uh, if you're thinking about P0, it's functions whereas the real numbers are values. They might look the same when you write them on paper, but the interpretation would be different. So yeah, we won't go too far into that. All right, let's do a quick follow-up clicker on that just to see how where people are on this and how new this all was. Just give me one second to go to the next question here. There we are. So if you think of all these sets, uh, which, which ones were the ones that you're familiar with originally? Let's 
give this a few more seconds. Cool, this is actually happening faster than it did in class. Fantastic, all right. With head. There we are. Let me zoom in on this so you can all see. But uh, all right, so the reals and complex, that was actually where I thought most people would be. And I'm glad to see some people have seen the natural numbers and the integers and in those before as well. Just for your own reference, these are the first things you'll have to memorize in the course because we are just going to pull out these set labels at random moments saying, hey, I'd like to have the reals right now. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but the the new ones for most people, the N's and the Z's, those also should be something that you're kind of practicing uh, getting into earlier rather than later, because these will show up, especially actually in this first few weeks. We use them fairly heavily uh, for interesting examples. In terms of the question that came up, is there a P minus one? No. Uh, so the N here would have to be greater than or equal to zero, and N would have to be an element of, the uh, one way you could say that is the natural numbers. So negatives would be an interesting thing to look at, but we're not going to, when we use PN, we're going to be using it strictly in the traditional polynomial sense. Okay, so set notation, I'm going to basically go through this fairly quickly because most of it's stuff that you've seen before. So we've actually even seen this earlier today. Like if you just list some numbers in curly brackets, then you have a list and that list is a set and what we would say is this is actually equal to the set one one two 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 five seven so duplicates don't count basically duplicates are ignored or don't count when we're talking about sets if anyone's done programming with uh, Python or some other language, they actually have a, or C++ too, they have a set command or a set object. And if you put in the same object again, it just keeps one of the examples of it because the, the sort of the unique list of the subset there. Um, set builders. So let me do the inform, informal one here first too. Uh, so often we'll write things like, four, five, six, seven, eight, dot, dot, dot. And we leave it to context what that actually means. Here, most of us would say, oh, I have a bunch of numbers that are going up by one. So it's probably 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. If we're just trying to get a point across, this is frequently how we do that. Another example would be something like 1, 4, 9, 16. And you're like, oh, that's a set of all the squared numbers. Now, of course, there's problems with that because we might not all get a chance to, <laughs> well, um, we might not get a chance to analyze this or we need to be a little more uh, sophisticated or specific about this. This is great for communication, but it's not so great for proving things. So what we might do is instead is this notation here where we say there's a variable and let's do it this way. So there's a bunch of X's and it's x's with a little condition, which is a colon. And sometimes people use a vertical bar here as well. So I'll do both. And then you add some conditions afterwards. So you might say that, OK, the x's have to be uh, part of the natural numbers. And they have to be less than or equal to 10. So that could be a condition. And this little bar here, or colon here, translate into the phrase uh, such that. That's usually how it's said out loud when you're reading it. So it's the set of all x's such that x is a natural number and x is less than or equal to 10. So this is comma here that implicitly is an and. Uh, so natural numbers less than or equal to 10, that would be the same as listing off natural start at zero. And again, we might use our dot, dot, dots here for the implied pattern, all the numbers from zero to 10 inclusive, inclusive because we had less than or equal to, that might be a way to describe a set in a more technical way. And sometimes it's handy. Uh, and again, order doesn't matter. And I should put that up here too. So we could have said this set is the same as seven, five, two, one. 
the order of the set doesn't matter duplicates don't matter it's just this list of elements presented in some way is all that matters for the uniqueness of a set <laughs> all right just a brief moment here I, for those who were here in yesterday's class, I think it said there is sort of a bait and switch with this uh, material that I talked about all these exciting applications and control theory and geotech and material science. Uh, here's here's the switch to what we're doing. So this is these are the practical things that we're going to ask you to work with and think about and reason with. It might not feel that exciting, but again, it's going to build up to uh, it's going to be a slow burn kind of class where we build up to a collection of real insights into how some of these things how these pieces fit together but we have to get through this <laughs> this is also just the building blocks and they're just sort of review sort of not exciting here we are all right define the following sets using set notation so again something like this we could easily define in explicitly as a list or we could define it as a set like we did in that last example where we say x is this time an element of z which are the integers and anything that communicates the range like this would do the job quite nicely so this the set of all x's such that x is an integer possibly negative or positive or zero and also that negative two is less than or equal to all those x's and five is greater than or equal to all those x's Okay. Um, all the real numbers between minus two and minus five inclusive, right? So this time notice it's real numbers. So this is actually very easy to model on these. First off, sorry, we cannot list, cannot list these. Why? Because there's an infinite number of them. Real numbers fill the real line in a dense fashion. But what we can do is just take that same notation we just did over here and instead of saying hey i'd like my x's to be integers i can just say my x's are going to be reals this time and they lie in the range from negative two to five we haven't talked about this a lot but you saw it a bit in 171 uh interval notation sometimes we would say that x is an element of minus two to five. You're actually going to see this in your web work. Uh, this is only for reals, for real numbers, real numbers. And basically it's uh, square black, square brackets mean uh, the endpoint is included, included. So if you have either of those, and round brackets at either end, whichever one, mean that the endpoint is not included. I just introduced this or remind you about this because it does show up in your web work for linear algebra for week one. Uh, set of all squared natural numbers. Yeah, this one's a bit interesting. Typically, what we would do here is we'd say, all right, I want a bunch of squared numbers, but because I need the square and I also need to say that there's natural numbers. So again, the ends, um, this is sort of a two stage one. I'd say my S's are actually built out of some X squareds where my X's are natural numbers. So this can feel a little bit counterintuitive at first, but let me make my colon a little more obvious here. We'd read this as I'd like all the numbers S such that S is the square of some other number, and those other numbers are the natural numbers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And if we actually go through this, we would say, all right, x is 0, x is 1, x is 2. Then the values that we get in here are the s's. Uh, we get 1 squared and 2 squared and so on. So this is a way to generate kind of in a programming way uh, the set of squared numbers using the kind of syntax that we introduced earlier. So this first element typically is always a variable by itself. And then all the logic happens after that little colon or again, a vertical bar. And just to not neglect our function spaces that we saw a little while ago, we can define this interesting thing 
uh, all the differentiable functions, all the infinitely differentiable functions. So this is somehow related to our C infinity thing here, which satisfy the derivative f of x equals one. Well, one way to do that is just our notation we just used. So I'd like some functions such that the functions are in C infinity. So they are infinitely differentiable and continuous on the reals. And, oh yeah, by the way, that the derivative of them equals one. So it's a perfectly valid way to define that set and it's sort of the literal translation of the words into the set notation. Of course, if you think about it for a bit, what are the functions that when we differentiate them give us one? Well, another alternative to that, that's anything with f being uh, of the form x plus some constant, let's call it not c, because we haven't seen enough c's today, uh, x plus a, where a is an element of the reals, where a is an element of the reals. I know we're switching gears here, but what functions have a derivative of one? Well, all the linear functions with a one multiplier out front of the x, those have a slope of one everywhere. So x plus c, x plus a, uh, this is a way to define that same set, knowing what we know about calculus. So we can have two very different looking definitions for the actual same set. All right. Moving your catalog right along. Again, if you have questions, I'm seeing some comments go by. Uh, once it's squared. Um, square root is a problem because uh, square root is then. Yeah, you could probably make that work. Sorry, I saw that other comment. Uh, this is, I think, cleaner. It's a little more intuitive that what that what you get is a squared thing rather than trusting the square root to exist. That gets a little dicey, as we'll talk about when we get to functions. All right, just starting. Just keep an eye on the time here as well. So that's all the basic sets. But we did have one other element that we introduced along the way, which was not just the basic building blocks of the reals, the complexes, naturals, and integers. We also considered the fact that we frequently work in 2D and 3D, say for the reals. Well, what that is, is courtesy of Descartes, who gave us the XY plane. Uh, these are called Cartesian product sets if we do that same process, maybe with another set. So what we do is we use that sort of little X multiplication symbol to combine two sets. Just a little illustrative example here with uh, two very simple sets. If we say A cross B or the Cartesian product of A and B, what we're gonna get is a set. And we're going to get tuples just like we do with say R2, where each element of the first, each of the first elements has to come from A. And then each of the second elements has to come from B. So one possible member of this set would be the tuple zero comma five, just like an X, Y coordinate essentially. And then of course you can exhaustively go through that list. Uh, zero five, zero seven, one five, one seven, and two five, two seven. Oops. So nothing deep going on here, just recognizing that sometimes we'd like to build pairs of sets that we already understand. And of course we can do these sets amongst themselves. We can take A and find its Cartesian product. And then it will be all the combinations of A with itself. Oops, get that second right there. And for those who like being completionists, it's straightforward to enumerate all the list of things here, two, one and two, two. And of course, you've already seen this notation before, we would also refer to this set as the A squared set, if that made sense in context, or wouldn't be confusing in context. Basically, I'd like some A's and some other A's in little paired tuples. That's what I would like to build. And of course we can go to triples, no problem with that. I won't exhaustively do this, but you can imagine five, five, five would be in here, and then five, five, seven, and a bunch of other ones all the way up to 777. Oops. We would just get a triple there. And again, we would probably start writing this with powers uh, like that. 
So if we do this kind of magic, uh, especially with a nice finite number of sets here, do a quick check in on this. How many elements would we have? I'm just giving you a new problem there on clicker. Sorry, so it's seeing, yeah, I'm pressing that. Uh, yeah, so if you have, I'll write it here for those who can't see it immediately. We got C is zero, one, two, and D is one, two, three, four, and five. And I'm asking about number of elements in C cross D. Interesting. Okay. Let's hold that thought. I'm seeing some interesting answers there, but they're... take a look back at this example here where we had A cross B and we ended up with, well, take a look. How many elements do we get there? Knowing that, uh, I'm going to call it the cardinality here, or the number of elements in A was two and the number of elements in B was three. And here, how many elements do we have given that a had three elements in it. So I'm going to reset that question. And there we go. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, think about that for a second and then think about the uh, C and D example. That's better. <laughs> Learning already is awesome. All right. Or some people might just be looking at the chat, and that's fair too. All right, uh, what have we got here? That'll do. So absolutely, it's the turn, turns out it actually is a product of this. So it's the number of elements in C times the number of elements in D uh, is what we're going to get out of that. And you can kind of see the mixing and matching. I get one choice for this. I'm sorry, I have three choices for this. And with each of those choices, I get to pair one of five. So I can do this three ways times the five ways I can do with that. Uh, just to be uptight about this, uh, three times eight. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I got in face to my answers. I'm glad I put the introduction there. You're absolutely right. Three times five is 15. And I will fix that for the next time around. <laughs> I appreciate that. Sorry. So this one actually is uh, the magnitude of C cross D is three times five, which is in fact, yes, 15. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. Uh, all right, a uh, quick thing about the order here. Uh, five, say so let's take this one at the top here. Five, five, five is not equal to, it's different from five, five, seven, obviously. And that's also not the same as seven, five, five. And this is exactly what your intuition tells you that this is not a set. It's not a set of five, five and seven, then order doesn't matter. No, no. The first element is different from what the second element represents, which is different from the third. And really the big comparison is these ones here. So let me just delete that. Oops. The order, uh, the placement order, placement, or the order uh, in the, within the tuples does matter. And again, this is just, the same as what you're used to in x, y. If I said the point two, one, is that the same as the point one, two? Well, you'd say no, of course, because one, the two quantities represented there represent different measurements. And so they shouldn't be confused. In fact, that brings us to some of our favorite sets, which are the product sets on the reals. So R2, this is the x, y plane. This is R3, which is the X, Y, Z, 3D space. And we also have RN. We're going to deal with this a lot. So this is RN, I guess, <laughs> pronunciation-wise. Uh, so pronounced RN. And this is N-dimensional. Dimensional. dimensional. Uh, 
vectors or n dimensional space. So this could be three, four, five, six. That doesn't look like an N. That looks like an N. So yeah, any number of dimensions. And for those who are thinking, gosh, why we never need more than three. Uh, yes, you do. Yes, you definitely do. For example, if you try to imagine this, what's called the state space for something like a helicopter, where you might have the rotation speed of one rotor, the position of the other rotor, the position of that same rotor. So position and velocity often end up being giving you two variables. Uh, position and velocity of the back rotor, and then all the states of all the input control systems. So your your gas, your fuel line, your, uh, I don't know helicopters well enough as I'm realizing right now, uh, the things that make the helicopter go and control, you'd have all the controls for that. So it's easy to get up to you know, 12, 15, even a thousand dimensions in some problems without batting an eye. So Thinking about Rn can be tremendously useful uh, for a wide variety of cases. R3 is nice to think in, but even though our real world looks like R3, the things that we want to analyze often live in much larger dimensional spaces. Uh, C N, same thing basically applies for the complex in N dimensions. There's no sort of short form there, but uh, this is N dimensional. And dimensional uh, complex space. And so this would be something like one plus zero i, two minus three i. You'd have a, a tuple of complex numbers with an element, an elements, an element tuple. And for those who are going on to ECE, EngPhys, and Apple Math, yep, this is going to be where you're heading pretty shortly after you get into uh, second year. So what can we do with this? Sometimes we can create sets that are useful. So if we wanted to represent binary numbers, so this would be things that look like the number 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 0, 7, 8 something that looks like that, then what we could build that out of is, well, each of these elements is in, let's call it B, which is the set of zero and one. And so this set, let's call it S, is something that we could build out of B to the power eighth. So it's going to be an eight long tuple that's perfect, where every element is just an element of zero or one. So the construction there, this would give us a ton of elements. And in fact, you can predict how big this is now. Uh, we'd have two times two times two times two times two uh, elements. But for now, it's just enough to be able to say, yeah, there's ways to build some interesting subsets or interesting new sets out of smaller and simpler building blocks. All right. Checking in, a few more minutes. All right. We might not get through all the notes today. We'll see how this plays out. I think the last example might get cut. We'll see. Um, again, not a lot of new stuff here. I think most of you have seen this idea before. If we talk about a single object belonging to a set, then we use this sort of epsilon looking symbol here. Uh, and we pronounce it is an element of all right, I'm doing my best to try to write legibly here. If you ever notice something you can't read, let me know. Um, so yeah, sort of this half loop circle and then a little straight line, that's typically how it's done. Uh, the not element of is fortunately very simple. It's the same thing, only we put a slash through it. So this would be is not an element of. And yes, the videos, the recordings for this are posted on, on Q rather than YouTube, but they're, they will be posted afterwards. Probably these ones, honestly, the next day because they, they have to get processed and downloaded. There's a bunch of junk at the start of the uh, thing we don't want to keep. Uh, and so what does this look like? Well, we asked the questions, hey, is 15.7 an element of the reals? Is it something that fits in the real number line? It absolutely does. Is 15.7 in the natural numbers? It is not because it does not 
it has this 0.7 on the end, so it's not an integer. And sorry, it's not a whole number. And it's also definitely not an integer for the same reason. So this is just illustrating how we can take single elements and say, hey, do you belong to this set or not? Uh, likewise, is the value minus three plus two i a real number? Absolutely not. It is, of course, a complex number, and it's way definitely not one of the uh, one of the integers. So I'm just going to go to the next question. There's a clicker question coming up in those last two there. Uh, is remember what c infinity is? C infinity is the set of continuous, continuous, and infinitely differentiable functions. Well, in that case, is a polynomial infinitely differentiable? Absolutely. So x squared plus one is definitely a member of C infinity. It's continuous everywhere in the reals, and it is infinitely differentiable. So next up, this is on the clicker question, is that same x squared plus one part of P2? Lovely, seeing the trend there, perfect. How about P1? Perfect, love it. Absolutely, P1 is of course the polynomials, well not of course, <laughs> some of you just learned it today, but now I'll say casually, of course, uh, polynomials of degree one or lower. And of course, that's a stumbling block for the x squared. In fact, what I want to do here is just contrast my colors a bit better so we can kind of see the differences. So not an element of, not an element of. Perfect. So yeah, this is a quadratic. And this is the set of linear functions only. Now, someone had an interesting point about the 15.7. And hey, it doesn't it also couldn't we also think of it as having a zero i on the end of it? And that's where you get into context. The fact that we didn't explicitly put it in there, basically it says we're not thinking of this as a tuple. If someone just says 15.7 and gives you no other context, the default is that's a real number because that's what we're most typically using. If they wanted to specify 15.7 plus zero i, I would be tempted to say that's not in the reals. You can have some fun debates about that, but basically this is a tuple and this is a single value. This is, has a real and imaginary components. Reals don't have both of those. So sometimes you have to be careful about how you're getting into that. But I would say no in this case here. Um, all right, I don't wanna keep you late. We got another six minutes. This is perfect, okay. So this is element by element. So single objects belonging to or subset of something else is this notation here. However, we also have relationships between two sets and we have a quality. So if two sets are equal, we kind of have some intuitive idea about that. But to make it more specific, if we're gonna say the two sets are equal, we actually have to have that every element here. So what we usually think of this as, you know, little x's lowercase are elements and the set labels are typically uh, uppercase letters. So every x, x is right here. Why am I saying it again? Every x or every element in A also happens to be in to B. And so if you think about a Venn diagram, all right, every element of A is also in B. But I want them to be equal. So we also say that every element in B, all the things in B are also in A. I have to have both of these true at the same time. Well, the only way for that to work, of course, as if they are actually the same set. So if here's A and then B includes exactly the same set of values, but it's hard to prove this. It's much more straightforward to look at an exhaustive list of all the elements of A and make sure they're in B and then to go back and look at an exhaustive list of the elements in B and show that they're also in the A set. So to illustrate that, if we take a quick look at this example here where we have five, two, three, 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 six, blah, 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 and a second set B, which is often sometimes we put the element of uh, in here, both of these are okay. 
uh, x element of the z's and x greater than one and x less than or equal to six. Sorry. Sometimes you just put the uh, the superset, if you like, of our membership right up front, or you can put it after the colon. It doesn't matter as long as the meeting's clear. So, well, okay, how does this work? Well, we, if we wanna prove that these two sets are equal, then what we'd have to do is look at first one is every element of A also in B. And for now, all we really have is an exhaustive list. So we'd have to look at five because five is in A. And we ask, is five in B? Well, something is in B if five is greater than, sorry, five is an element of the integers, is five greater than one, and is five less than or equal to six. And we go down the list and we say, yes, yes, yes. So five is in B. You already feel the tedium coming in right now, can't you? So two is an element of A. Is two in B as well? Well, is two an element of element of Z? Is two greater than one? Is two less than or equal to six? Yes, yes, yes. So it's all yeses. So two is an element of B. And you can pretty much go down the list here. Hey, three, four, and six also satisfy all those things. Three, four, and six. So all elements of A of A are in B. All right, so that's half of it. That's the first half, showing that every element of A is in B. But then of course we have the complement to show that they're equal. Uh, so if we take a look at B, we would usually approach this a bit differently because B is a bunch of Zs. So it's all the numbers, all the integers. Oops, it's all wrong, no. Uh, it's all the integers. So all the numbers from minus two to minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, and seven, and eight. And then if we apply these conditions, X has to be strictly greater than one that wipes out everything, including one. And x greater or less than or equal to six, that rules out seven, eight, and all these other ones. So this is equal to, so b is this set here with all those elements crossed off, which is the same as two, three, four, five, six. And all these elements are also in a. Perfect. So, so we have both directions. All elements of A are also in B. And two, all, I should probably put that better short form. Elements of B are also in A. So the set A is the same identical set as the set B. All right, I think we're gonna stop there for today. Yeah, we'll stop there for today. We'll talk about the subsets. I'll do a brief recap on that first topic when we start again on Thursday. So thank you very much. I didn't wanna keep you late, especially for, oh, sorry, I had a last slide here. Um, choo -choo -choo. Yes, for those who are writing the deferred uh, 171 exam this evening, good luck on that. And hopefully we'll have good news to report to you about a week after that. So thank you very much. And if anybody has questions about anything we covered today, feel free to unmute and ask or type in the chat.